Okay, so maybe I, I can uh, uh, kick off uh, our session while um, we try to figure out a little bit, uh, figure out a little bit the technological part of um, of, um, of current presentation. Um, first of all, I wanted to. Um, Thank uh, everyone for, for being here and for your interest in uh, in this in this presentation. We, uh, we I was just mentioning over lunch that um, we left it open. We didn't really mobilize any particular group of people uh, to come today. So if you are here, it's because you have a genuine interest in what's going to happen, and we are very happy to have you here. Um, the the idea to have a seminar to discuss uh, Karen Karsian's book. A terrazma that you actually have here, and you should at some point come and, and, and look through it, uh, began uh, to take shape uh, last year uh, when one of our postdoctoral students here at SESH, Anna uh, Durtsian, discussed Karen's book as well as other Armenian authors um, dealing with the war and violence in their literary works. Uh, and this discussion took place in the context of an optional course. Um, uh, on called States and Conflicts in the Post-Soviet Space that I teach uh, at the BA in International Relations at the Faculty of Economics here. And at the time, uh, Antonio uh, Sosa Rivera kindly agreed to comment on Anna's presentation and we all agreed uh, that Karen's book uh, was extremely stimulating uh, and deserved a more detailed uh, exploration which could um, once more kind of help us think about the important interdisciplinary links between the study of international politics in this case and literary studies. Um, and so coming from the field of international relations and, and having accompanied uh, the political, uh, political events in Armenia and the South Caucasus over the last decade, I, I really consider it a privilege um, to be able to understand how the Armenian society expresses its own dilemmas and questionings through artistic expression. Uh, and the possibility to understand how war has historically been present in this popular imaginary uh, upon which the processes of state building and nation building in Armenia have, have developed. Uh, and this is, of course, I think, crucial to understand the current choices taking place in this case, in the Armenian context, um, as well as the potential alter alternatives that are offered uh, uh, to, to this country. And I would say that we were fortunate enough to have um, uh, developments in Armenia over the last weeks that make our discussions here today uh, even more, more relevant. I mean, if you may have accompanied what is going on in Armenia with a series of peaceful, popular demonstrations that resulted in the resignation of the former prime minister, then president, then something else. <laughs> Uh, Sarsian, and, and therefore we are living in an exciting time also in Armenia in terms of the possibilities of overcoming some legacies, transforming others, what can be done, how can the Armenian um, country and, and, and nation move forward uh, with this new project. And so uh, I think uh, this opens new exciting possibilities for a more inclusive and democratic future and hopefully a more peaceful one. Um, Karen's book is not, uh, as you will understand, a typical popular expression of traditional Armenian culture. I don't think you would portray it that way yourself. <laughs> I think it is rather just um, another image, but I would say it's rather another possible uh, image of Armenia <clears throat> that has, I think, that is created as a contestation of predominant views, and in that process also kind of seeks to open space for new possibilities. And giving voice to these many expressions of Armenian culture and its views uh, on the future of the country and on the future of the Karabakh uh, conflict as well, among other issues, I think it's perfectly in line also with the mission here uh, that we have here at SESH. Um, and so we are very much delighted to have this session of interdisciplinary dialogue and to be able to hopefully make a small contribution to imagining uh, new ways to break the structures of war uh, and violence and to recreate a space for peace uh, and dialogue. So, very briefly, uh, today's session will begin with Karen's presentation uh, of, of his book, uh, including a musical performance, as you can see. Uh, it will then 
be followed by comments by Antonio Sosa Ribeiro and Mark Nishanian. We are really thankful for both of you for agreeing to, to do this. And we are delighted to uh, also uh, count uh, today um, uh, with the, the partnership with Lupin Camp Foundation. That's Nick Panosian, the director for the Armenian Communities, is here. Thank you so much for, for teaming up with Sarah for this. Um, and so, if Karen is. Karen is out? Karen is ready, huh? Almost? Oh, there you go. <laughs> I won't take any more of your time and I'll let him off to uh, his presentation. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you for your patience, first of all. And uh, I'd like to uh, thank the organizers. I'd like to thank the senior. Antonio and Anna for making this possible. I would also like to thank uh, the Guggenheim Town Foundation to making this, for, for making this possible as well. Uh, without their support, this probably wouldn't even happen today. So I'm glad to be here uh, to, in one of the most unexpected for me places, to present a book that is, to me, untranslatable. Uh, it was written in Armenian. And uh, so it's a pleasure and honor to be here, and thank you for your attendance. Um, so, dismembering words, language, as a first casualty of war. Truth is the first casualty of war. Written by British politician Philip Snowden in 1916, this expression abounds in media and literature even today. Politically speaking, it's witty and poignant, but not quite accurate from the philosophical viewpoint. Truth is the first casualty of language. Here I recall Nietzsche, only through forgetfulness can man ever achieve the illusion of possessing a truth. However, even as an illusion there is no truth outside human mind, there is no truth outside language. Therefore, the first and foremost victim of war is none other than language. So, I would like to step beyond good and evil, truth and lies, moral and non-moral sense, and take a broader view of this victim, language as a whole. When I was a little boy, in mid-1980s, I was angry and ashamed that my native city of Yerevan had not been razed to the ground during the World War II. Interestingly, the title Hero of the Soviet Union was awarded not only to people, but also cities. So they had all been partially or completely destroyed during Nazi Germany's Operation Barbarossa. And it was heartbreaking to gaze at the glorious list of all these 12 hero cities and not find my own among them. No. The fact, the fact that my paternal grandparent had his hand disfigured in the same war was no comforting enough. Not comforting enough. Nor was I considered, well, nor was I consoled by the fact that my maternal grandparent had lost a whole leg. To me, it seemed very unfair that my city had remained intact while all these poor cities were crumbling one by one. What I felt was probably a hybrid of the survivor syndrome, as well as admiration with the Phoenix myth and the Soviet relentless propaganda of self-sacrifice and heroism. What I felt is best summarized by Andreas' words from Life of Galileo by Brecht. Unhappy the land that has no heroes, but I added cities, hero cities, in my head. When the Second Karabakh War broke out some 30 years later, on April 2nd, 2016, the news left me shocked and horrified. Until that day, I had been working on a collection of poems and was preparing to have it published in a matter of months. But the terrible news left me speechless while I was picturing throngs of young soldiers shattered to pieces like empty vases falling one after the other before you had a chance to put flowers in them. Unaccomplished dreams, aspirations, talents, loves were being exterminated by the minute as I sat in my office of, in Los Angeles, paralyzed and devastated by my inability to stop the wholesale meat grinding of the Armenian and Azeri teenagers. 
I closely followed the Defense Ministry's Facebook page. And uh, Uh, living statistics aside, they were they were posing uh, teenagers. Uh, in, in, uh, they were they were posting information on every individual fallen uh, soldier. It was each post contained the following. We are mournful and proud. Private name and last name, date of birth, vigil to take place at address, funeral to take place at address. We could no longer avoid tragedy by closing our eyes with statistics. Not numbers, but humans, moreover, in plain clothes. Some 30 years later, Galileo, from the same play by Brecht, answered Andrea with my lips, no, unhappy the land that is in need of heroes. For years, the conflict resolution process had been in stalemate. Azerbaijan was believed to have chosen the tactics of waiting it out. And uh, given the constantly shrinking population of Armenia, two and a half million, and a poor economy, and conversely, the continuous increase in Azerbaijan's population, nine million, and the oil boom, the prospect of resolution for many looked like this. But that doesn't. Is the Armenian word for war crossed my mind time and again as leitmotiv? I stopped reading books or articles. The exception was the news from the front. And still I read them hinting every word in those texts, every letter. Their impeccable grammar angered me. Their correct spelling irritated me. Their punctual punctuation punctured my patience. All those words were imposters and hypocrites. How could these texts claim to speak the truth about war without bearing all of its destructive consequences? It was the same sense of unfairness I had in childhood with regard to my native city. And finally, language gave in. It collapsed before my eyes. For the first time in my life, I noticed the Armenian word for dream hidden inside the war, in plain sight. I instantaneously made a poster that looked like this. I printed out the, the word paterazm, the war, cut out the word dream, tore it to pieces, photographed and put it back into the word paterazm, and added the letter A, which means it's war. Then I had no idea that this poster would become the cornerstone of a book of 480 pages that would be written within around four months. But now, but now, with the word dream exterminated and mutilated, the word war now read, tell a story, Batma, in an Armenian dialect. And I did. One principle that I established for this book at the get-go was to avoid the trap of romanticizing war at any cost. Unlike Guillaume Apollinaire, who had set himself a goal to sing the beauty of all sorrows, here is one of the many. I hurl my bottles everywhere like charming artillery shells. After the fall of the dream, in a chain reaction, I saw a bunch of other words that had been trapped in the word war, all this time unbeknownst to me, or perhaps any Armenian speaker for that matter. Imagine the word war actually spelled like this. Uh, Father, wall, stalemate, height, lie, lord, dream. Now imagine the Portuguese word, guerra, spelled like this. So this is the English version, and this is the Portuguese version. So this is the Armenian word for war. It sounds more like one of those Icelandic volcanoes, doesn't it? Well, that is how Armenians call war, unbeknownst to them. It is not quite obvious since many of the letters of these words overlap, making it difficult to, to, to detect. What looks like scribbles on both sides is actually uh, the Armenian 
uh, a word for for the, the zimbor, the soldier, and uh, which means soldier. I created a 3D army with that word. Most importantly, the enemy side is the same word zimbor, except it's in its mere reflection. Essentially, they are the same, like in this funny cartoon I found it recently. Let me see. That's one. The same stuff. It's just the description is different. Tom Gold, a very good one. Each of these words, except for, for one, Father, is the title of a chapter, and one of them, Aterasma, its hate war, is also the title of the book. Why? The book became, in many ways, a reaction to the fool, and one of the best-known novels of the 19th century Armenian literature. The book was conceived as a wake-up call to the Armenians of Western Armenia under the Ottoman rule to take up arms, put an end to the constant massacres and racketeering by Turkish and Kurdish forces, and fight for their freedom. Published in 1881, the book not only became one of the most popular reads of the time, but has continued wielding its patriotic influence on the generations to come. It's one of the, one of the key works in school curricula. The book proved instrumental in rekindling the sense of national identity among the oppressed Armenians. So the book is a reaction to some of the key statements in, in, in this, uh, in Rafi's book. So this is Rafi, 1835, 1888. And this is one of his statements that my book is a reaction to. Happy is the people that can hate. He who cannot hate remains deprived of love. This is a deeply troubling statement. Hatred creates recurring cycles of violence, war, and most importantly, extreme dehumanization of the enemy, which makes it easier to kill them. There is no sensible dialogue going on between the Armenian and Azerbaijani populations, which allows the governments to lead more credible campaigns of demonization. No Armenian is allowed to set foot in Azerbaijan, even if they are citizens of other countries. This hatred often achieves incredible levels of sheer stupidity. Last year, an Azerbaijani soccer commentator was fired after daring to praise then Manchester United midfielder Henrik Mkhitaryan's game. And I was extremely saddened when an attempt by some Armenian peace activists a few years ago to organize a screening of Azerbaijani films in Armenia was met with hateful and aggressive protests that foiled it. Hate is a poison that poisons both the hater and the hated. The other phrase that Aterasma focuses on is as follows. He who cannot use arms, who is incapable of shedding blood and killing people, he is told, you have no right to be free. He seems to put too heavy a price on freedom, doesn't he? But doesn't it ring a bell? Isn't it one of the key messages in José Saramago's blindness? Let's remember the circumstances of the murder that eventually brought forth the liberation of the main characters. I believe the biggest trouble is not when one takes desperate measures in desperate times, but when one continues taking desperate measures when desperate times are far behind thanks to those very desperate measures. The first chapter of Wall, which is called Wall, is in a way about a person who longs for freedom but doesn't want to shed blood for it. Instead, he hates those who give orders to kill and plunder. The prototype of this character is Zura. So this is the first chapter, but, wall, and this is Zura. After the collapse of the dream, I saw the word wall with largely predictable associations, but it also reminded me of Zura from Legend of Suram Fortress, a Georgian legend by Daniel Chonkadze, made into an award-winning film by Sergei Parajanov. According to the legend, Zurab is a young man who is immured alive inside the wall of Surami fortress. Um, Surami fortress to keep it from crumbling ahead of an impending Turkish assault. In the Georgian legend, Zurab is forcefully immured in the wall. For me, Zurab symbolized all these conscripts who were guarding the Armenian border as a result of compulsory military service. Instead of immuring them in a wall, they were in a way immured in a World War I style trenches to keep their homeland from falling apart. Moreover, I made Zurab a part of the book. According to the legend, the area where Zurab is immured occasionally gets moist, wet. In the preface of the book, I modified the ending of the legend saying that after immurement, 
Occasionally, very weak voice can be heard. That ghost of his voice pronounces the word war, the Armenian word, pateras, by always rearranging the sounds and never pronouncing the actual word war as if it's a taboo. But, so the first chapter wall consists of the anagrams of the Armenian word war. All these texts that I will read are composed of only words that spell the word war in different uh, arrangements. Such words are free, garden, field, flock of birds, root, ax, ox, cloud, lord, hate, and so on. So, so these are before I go on with the chapter wall, these are the chapters, just for you to have an idea of the structure. This is Lies, the previous one was the Hate, which is the title of the book, Aterasma, it's a non-existing word which means it's hate war. Lies, Lord, God, Dream. And as you notice, and Mom, as you notice, these these uh, these two armies as if uh, kill the word before actually fighting each other. They kill meanings, they kill culture, they break up stuff before contacting each other. They get rid of the language that is between them so they can kill each other. And so that is why at the end they will finally uh, get rid of the word and fight each other. Also this symbolizes the progress during the war of Gaining territories, losing territories, you know, that's part of the way of the uh, the book. Right. So, now the chapter wall. So this is the word free. And this is how it works. The word free immured in a wall. The brickwork is produced with the word wall. So. so Free field. It's hard to read because the words are behind the wall, and it's when when you look go through the book, it's gonna, on a, in a, to a certain degree, uh, get on your nerves, because and that's that's one of the uh, purposes, you know, to make you sick because of the wall and for you to realize how it impedes your understanding of some texts. Free field. Free field, free garden, free clouds. This is the voice of the person that is immured in the wall. And these are, again, the words that are, that are part of the word war. Free dance, free hair, free dream, free flock of birds, free mood. Simple dream. To live freely, to dance freely, to put down roots freely. Mom, mom, void. Dad, stir. Mind dance. This is dance banging against the walls, axe banging against the walls, hair banging against the walls, cloud banging against the walls, flock of birds banging against the walls, ox banging against the walls, garden banging against the walls, field banging against the walls, battle banging against the walls. And this is the same one word, flock of birds banging against the word, flock of birds banging against the wall, just ten times. That was the translation. And this is the flock of birds trying to escape the wall that are inside. And they're out of luck, they'll collapse. This is the word yeram. In Armenian, flock of birds is just one word, yeram. And so they're all there. Failed escape, flocks of birds fall, piling up on top of one another. And then, battle made of walls, or battle of walls. Hate battles. So, the battle of walls, when you get rid of the first letter of the word wall, you get the Western Armenian of uh, imperative of the word hate. Hate battles. So, battle of walls turns into Hate battles. And these are the words I hate masters, I hate God, I hate walls. Once engaged in a battle, check and checkmate. 
and this is actually the same word wall, which makes up the brickwork, zoomed in. And the reason why it is done is, is the Armenian word for wall is also chester, meaning stalemate. It's the Latin word pat that coincides with the Armenian word wall. And still, uh, the employment of chess terminology helps us draw parallels not only with chess rules, but also a very curious chess related situation in Alice in Wonderland, the Rat Queen, in fact. So, in our country, Alice crossly tells the Queen, you generally get to somewhere else if you run very fast for a long time. Astonished, the queen explains things to Alice. Here, you see, it takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place. So this is the, so this talks about the arm race right now going on between Armenia and Azerbaijan. They just keep running, you know, so that they can stand, stay in the same place. And at that time when I was writing the book, of course, this was a hint at Serge Sarkisian because he was this big lover of chess and he was the head of the chess federation in Armenia. And then this is the statement by a Georgian uh, writer that says, if, if a country has someone who is capable of immuring himself in a wall of a fortress, that country and its people will be invincible. And so, as you can see, the wall is built around that free person and covering, it up, covering him up. And then he's, he's trying to get out of this. By the way, can you please make it off the screen? I don't know how to do this. Yes, you are a little bit of 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 This is from Sergei Parajanov's movie, Legend of Suram. And is there footage and music? He gets, he gets orders, burn fields, burn roots, burn clouds, burn flocks of birds, burn ethnic garments, birth, burn dreams. And what he hears is burn masters, burn command, commandants, burn God, burn walls, burn vices, then burn out. And so the last word, burn out, which is in Armenian, mare, in Armenia, it has several meanings. It, it is also the word mother, uh, especially used uh, like a long time ago, not, no, not anymore in Western Armenia. Uh, but it also means to burn out, switch off, or turn off. And so this is the word that is left at the end. And now we're zooming out. Keep zooming out. See? 
this area is the same as you saw before this and so we keep zooming out and now that's where that's where everything else was happening that I just wrote so just imagine what else is happening all around <laughs> since it was a story so it's a fractal and so it's all a wall within a wall within a wall within a wall and then the final zoom out. And this is we're back to the battlefield. And now the next chapter is Akarasma, hate. So the next chapter is composed of text uh, and the, the actual dismemberment of uh, these statements. And these statements are from, um, from other writers, not me. So this is the word spring in Armenian, garo. And when you remove the first letter of the word spring, you are left with the word blood, aru. And uh, this word became a symbol of what happened in April as a war. This was also symbolizing the Korean genocide, which also happened in April. And it also, to a certain extent, symbolizes what happened on March 1st, which is also spring, in 2008, when 10 people, 10 protesters were killed. And they tried to oust that same Prime Minister Sef Sarkisyan that eventually came up a few weeks ago. So, this is a phrase from a famous, very well-known Armenian song, Garuna Zunare, which means, it's spring, yet it snows. The thing is that, this was uh, written by uh, a very famous Armenian composer, Komitas, who went mad during the genocide, seeing the atrocities and murder of his old pals and friends. And he, he spent the rest of his life in, uh, in a French hospital and never again composed a single note. Um, so this was a love song, which meant, oh, I think the, there was something wrong with, with his love for a woman, and so it says, oh, it's spring, yet it snows. But if you ask, most of the Armenians will not actually know that it was a love song, because of Parur Sevak, which was a very famous Armenian poet in the 50s, 60s, 70s. He basically used, he wrote a long poem about the Armenian genocide, and used this song, the words of the song, it's spring, yet it snows, to mean something else, of what happened to Armenians in genocide, during the Armenian genocide. It's spring, yet it snows. So I, I, I used. So if you ask a lot of people, like, what is this phrase from? And well, they're gonna think, oh, this is about genocide. No, it's not. It's a love song that is forgotten. It's no, not, not anymore a love song. So I changed it. Say it's spring, yet it wars. A war has begun. So here, the word dream is falling off the word war. And this is how I made a video. Tita Hoganjner, Tita Hoganjner, O Tita Harbek, Tita Hishner, O Tita Hakalbek, Tita Hishner. Kamail Harharozo. And that's a, we have two words for laughing, so the next one is with the other word. 
O harhara har vek harhariçler, o harhara vor vek harhariçler, vor harharum en hararosterov, vor harharar pum en hararabar, o harhadar vek harharovin, o harharastan hararatovat, harharot, harharçakavor, harhariçleri, o harhara var var bir hararavari, hararot, hararakokos hararotleri, hararhen, hararhen, hararotir, hararakotir, hararikler, hararikler. It snows, it's spring, yet it snows. So, so this next uh, phrase is the word peace falling apart. The Armenian word for peace is even longer than the word than the word for war. A literal translation of the word is more like peacefulness. Interestingly, another thing that I noticed only after the April War is that the first syllable of the Armenian word for peaceful means game or play. So I immediately put it on the operating table of my book. After I sliced the game off the piece, I was surprised that the word peace could be so sensitive to the amputation. I saw the word tear up before my eyes. The thing is that I had shifted my attention from the falling game to what was left of the piece. At the top, it read saltness. But the fall of the word game heralding the beginning of a war is like an illustration of a brilliant observation from Heusinger from Homo Ludens. Ever since words existed for fighting and playing, men have been warned to call war a game. We have already posed the question whether this is to be regarded only as a metaphor and come to a negative conclusion. Language everywhere must have expressed measures in that way from the moment words from combat and play existed. We can only speak of war as a cultural function so long as it is waged within a sphere of, sphere of those members who regard each other as equals or antagonists with equal rights. In other words, its cultural function depends on its play quality. This condition changes as soon as war is waged outside the sphere of equals against groups that are not recognized as human beings and thus deprived of human, right, human rights, barbarians, devils, heathens, heretics, and lesser breeds without the law. In such circumstances, war loses its play quality altogether and can only remain within the bounds of civilization insofar as the parties to it, to it accept certain limitations for the sake of their own honor. So this is what happens 
in the Armenian-Azerbaijani uh, conflict is there is total dehumanization and demonization of each other. And this is what happens during the war. They're so afraid to become prisoners of war that they basically blow each other up, if we're just not to get in there. And, uh, and so this word uh, shows the state of uh, the condition uh, of a war. <laughs> this is a, a statement from uh, Martin Luther King. Uh, in the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. And the interesting thing about this is, at the end was silence. The rest of the words fall off, and this is what we're left. However, the, the way I, I did it at the beginning was, uh, I didn't include it here, uh, because it will be long to explain, but I'll just give a little note. So, uh, the way, the first thing, it, eventually, like, one by one the words fall off until they get to the final point of uh, the, the gospel. Uh, here, the first thing that is falling off is the uh, plural suffix, uh, the genitive case of the word friends, like, and uh, the silence of our friends. So in English it would, uh, just the, word, the, the letter S would fall off. But in Armenian, it's like four letters. And when you take it out, it actually means forgive. And so that's what's falling off at the beginning. And then we end up with this. Okay. And then everything else is also gone. Oh, the silence too. And all we're left is a comma, our last hope. So the next chapter deals with uh, Sebet, lies. And uh, I'm not going to go through this because of a short time. I'll just concentrate on this little one. Uh, this is um, the, the current situation in Armenia and Azerbaijan is often described as a state of neither war nor peace. So I coined the new phrase, mixing both. In Portuguese, it would sound perra e gaz. Um, so in Armenia, it's like Look at this is a chapter about God. This is from Tolstoy, uh, War and Peace. It says, it is all in God's hands. You may die in your bed, or God may spare you in a battle. And this is, it is all in God's hands, in the form of a... Yeah. Yes. Yes. And... Um, Giving up self, uh, giving up your freedom of, uh, of your free will, or your giving up your responsibility and giving up to God, self examination in a way. This is um, a little uh, excerpt from uh, Tumanyan, uh, an Armenian writer, uh, Tumanyan's poem. It's uh, May God protect your son. How was how was the taste of my little one? The actual uh, the entire poem is four lines actually. So this is how it works. In my dream, an ewe, uh, kind of a deer, uh, came up to me with a question. May God protect your son. How was the taste of my little one? And so I just removed the part of, about the deer and just left it out of context. So not just a deer, but anyone. And after all the letters fall off, only God remains in the sky. But then, this is what happens. The letter S falls off, the second letter of the God falls off. And when it, when it does, the, the Armenian word for God becomes the word hating one, Advats. And then he collapses as well. It's like the, uh, this Tom and Jerry effect that Slava Zizek likes to talk about. That you know, God is dead. It's just he doesn't know it for a while, and then he just looks down and oh, I'm dead, and then he collapses, just like Tom when he's running after Jerry. It's when he he goes past the precipice and without knowing he's passed, and then pulls off. It's just one of the uh, interpretations. So this this is this part of it about the mom. My black heart, your rose-colored sorry and pride. This is uh, the phrase, as I told you initially, the way the self-defense minister was describing the deaths. 
they were always starting with sorry and proud. And so there's this expression in Armenian, it usually means my black heart and your rosy pants or panties. So I, I just changed it to make it not pants or panties, but uh, rather the sorry and pride of the word defense minister. And so what happens is everything else becomes rosy, but the letters that make up the word mother. She is in black. And this is the dream. The inspiration behind this dream chapter was from Banksy. You know, his graffiti of this little kid, little girl, uh, using the parking, the letter A for swinging. And also this one, which I actually noticed after publishing my book. And this is actually more descriptive of what, I, what I've done in the chapter Dream. This is in Palestine, on the wall, where these kids are using this uh, tower as a playground themselves. And so this is what I did. The word, the Armenian word, but p, the letter p, p has these two uh, ropes that I uh, modified into actual ropes for the swing. And this is a little kid right here that is swinging. And this is the word but. And this is how it does. And then. This is what happens. At, at one point, the child is like you know, taking, getting momentum and flying really high, and this, way, this is what happens. The thing is that uh, the last two letters of the Armenian word uh, child actually are the first two letters of the Armenian word for peace. So this is the word peace, and it works this way. So in the book, it's the, it's the next part, next chapter, not the next page. And I have an animation for this, so it's more easier for you. The word mom, nursing the world, the word child, a suckling. Like you see, the word mom is like two boobs. And these are the chi children that are swinging with the word wall. And there are many more, more of them, more of them. This is, the expression behind this is Warhol. Andy Warhol. And now it's empty. They're all gone. And the swing goes on. And the child pulls on. And this is the, the Armenian letter Z, which I actually drew with my hand. And the, the first letter of the word soldier. It looks like crosses, there it's them collapsing. that I made uh, using the, about this chapter.
now the word dream is being eaten by these two armies, so the, the remnants. And this, this is where they actually face each other. And this is the same army, but from a different perspective. That, the other one was a bird's eye view. Looks like a penis, doesn't it? This is how they actually come in. And this is, again, bird's eye view. They were already mixed into each other. And as these armies join to each other, I get this image. As you see, this was completely coincident. This is what happens when these letters Z get into each other. And this, finally, just imagine me sitting and playing with these two tags and getting this, whoa! And I, was, I lived alone at the time, it was dark. I'm an atheist, but something's happened in there. Mm -hmm. So this is the final moment of them all into each other. So, just a few words about this. I would like to read some ex excerpts uh, from Steinbeck's Once There Was a War, 1943. The troops in their thousands sit on their equipment on the dock. It is evening, and the first of the demount, uh, first of the demount lights come on. The men wear their helmets, which make them all look alike, make them look like long rows of mushrooms. Their rifles are leaning against their knees. They have no identity, no personality. The men are units in an army. The night before the battle. Here I would like to read a fragment from Once There Was a War with John Steinbeck again. So this is about, the, I already showed you the battle, but uh, this is what is happening before. The men sit about and for a time they talk and laugh and make jokes to cover the great occasion. They try to reduce this great occasion to something normal, something ordinary, something they're used to. They rag one another, accuse one another of being scared, they repeat experiences of recent days, and then gradually silence creeps over them, and they sit silently because the hugeness of the experience has taken them over. These are green troops, they have been trained to a fine point, hardened, instructed, and they lack only one thing to make them soldiers, enemy fire, and they will never be soldiers until they have it. No one, least of all themselves, knows what they will do when the terrible thing happens. No man there knows whether he can take it, knows whether he will run away or stick or lose his nerve and go to pieces or will be a good soldier. In the moonlight on the iron deck, they look at each other strangely. Each man in this last night in the moonlight looks strangely at the others and sees death there. This is the most terrible time of all. This night, before the assault by the new green troops, they will never be like this again. Every man builds in, in his mind what it will be like, but it is never what he thought it would be. The men sitting on the deck disappear into the blackness and the silence, and one man begins to whistle softly, just to be sure he is there.
Argo Pact. Oh, sorry, I'm missing. It's Vasks. I like both of them, they're both Baltic composers, but this was uh, Peteris Vasks. Okay, so what happens after they're, they, they kill each other? They turn into this uh, skull and they turn into this video. Engage in the battle, go ahead, check and check me. text that follows uh, the events. And this uh, is, my understanding of it is what's left of all those letters soldier after the fight. Because although it was just the word Zinvor, soldier, but when you cut the word, slice the word and open it, there are probably tons of letters in there, just like organs that are not visible from outside, but they're there. So this is basically their internal organs all spilled up, their guts. So this is the text. And if you notice, the text is upside down. To, in order to read it, you have to uh, bring them back from death. And read it. I have to explain before I read, unfortunately, but um, this, again, is a text that is uh, partially um, written by me, but I've used idioms, Armenian idioms, only, okay? And they, they don't mean what they actually seem to you, or even to an Armenian reader. When an Armenian reader reads it, reads it or hears it, at the beginning they may think, oh, this is a metaphor, or this is an idiom, but at one point they'll forget about it, because they keep repeating and it messes with your brain. So you no longer think of them as metaphors, but you start thinking of them as actual direct meaning. And let me read this now. And Neither warmth nor coldness came out of, his, out of the mouth. The tongue shrank. The tongue fled into the throat. Down tumbled the heart toward the knees. The tongue plummeted into the belly. No voice came out of the belly. The ear got pierced, faceless. He tried to save his face, fell into fire. The facial skin tore up. The eyes jumped up onto their forehead. Hanging face, he stuck up his chin toward the sky. His tooth hit a rock. He let it fly out of his mouth, toothless. He became a stamping ground for feet. Lost the whole of his mouth. His belly touched his back. He has no spine, spineless. The wound reached the very depth of his heart. He hit his head against the wall. His belly scraped the dirt. A rock fell off his chest. His chin banged into a rock. His nose bumped into a rock. He was not stuck under the tongue. A hair was missing from his head. He put the head onto the palms of his hands. He took the head away. The heart was pierced. The dirt burned under his feet. His heart was set afire. The lungs spilled out of his mouth. He lost the dimensions of his mouth. Ruptured mouth. 
Despite having a mouth, he has no nose. His eyes popped out of their sockets. The eye was left in somebody else's hand. He bestowed freedom onto his hands. They scraped out of their skin, exhaust ejected from his nose. The right hand did not know what the left one was doing. His nose reached the heaven. Legs and arms were falling. He had to take his legs off. This leg will never set foot in this house. The hen was left on the dry soil, turning into meat and blood. He is incapable of wiping his own nose. His mouth stretched wide from one ear to the other, turned red up to the tip of his ears. He was a wineskin of blood, lay down onto a moist place. He was wet to the bone. There was no bone under his tongue. A bone got stuck in his throat. There was a rock under the tongue. The tongue dried up in the mouth. It flew out of his head, lodged into someone else's skin. It went through one ear and came out of the other. He was all bone and blood. His ear was bloodied. Blood was dripping off his cheeks. Flame touched his heart. Fire spewed out of his mouth. Feet were trampling him down. His nose was cut off his face. His face was pressed down to where feet had trodden. He wallowed under the feet, lost his face, lacked a face. The heart smoked. When a knife was stabbed into his heart, no bleeding followed. There is no heart beneath the chest. A heart broke into his mouth. The heart got out of his mouth. The heart struck someone else. The feet took off from the ground. The heart was sliced into multiple pieces, open-hearted. Open mouth, a hole in the ear, all nose dived under trampling feet, perforated eye, perforated mouth, perforated belly. His legs were yanked from inside his belly. Blood was dripping out of his eyes. A worm had dropped into the blood. The dry tree was daubed with blood. He got out of fire, but fell into the flames. He is fire. His clothes are fire. Which fire is he to withstand? He is black. His clothes are zilch, his gallbladder ruptured, fire spewed out of his eyes, his intestines were torn into smithereens, the flavor of shit was unleashed, he was deprivatized, meat was ripped off the nail, blood rushed into his head, he got rid of both his head and his headache, he took away his ear threw his tongue out, both hands in fire. He fell in between two fires. Half of his meat melted away. His tongue got trapped behind his uvula. His eyes leapt to the top of his head. He didn't own his own head. He had lost his hair, a hole in the head, empty head, brainless. The gentle threads of his heart were touched. Blood oozed from his heart. His heart found its way to his heels. He showed his heels, spread his heart before many a foot. He opened his heart before every single person. The knife reached the bone, pierced the eye. Wind burst in his head. The worms wiggled in his head. They won't get out of his head. There are snakes in his belly. A snake got into his ear. A cat got into his belly. Mice were playing around in his pockets. He was buried under tasks. Snow sifted all over his head. Moss sprouted on his back. So these are metaphors that mean something completely different. What they actually mean is, I just read a little excerpt so you, so you can understand. This is a literal translation of these metaphors, what these actual metaphors uh, mean when they when they are used. What he said was neither good nor bad, failed to speak daringly, shut up, was awfully frightened, out of fear he kept his mouth shut, don't utter a sound, didn't utter a sound, it sounded rude and sharp. Brazen, he tried to restore his honor and got into trouble. His true nature was uncovered. He was astounded. His mood spoiled. He grew presumptuous, became a stuck-up. The challenges were beyond his capabilities. Indecisive, he became a doorman. Eating and drinking uncontrollably, he became extremely underweight. Failed to find any protector, wishy-washy. He took deep offense to no effect. He demonstrated servility, overcame depression. All his initiatives failed. He ran into an obstacle, didn't hesitate to make a tit-for-tat response, made a threat, felt hopeless, bored everyone with his unending speeches, caused sorrow, became very worried, thrilled and inspired in others, and blah, blah, blah. You see, it has nothing to do with war, nothing whatsoever. So, what, what, what is this? Then? I don't know, I'm, I'm, until this day I'm trying to understand what I did. I'm, I'm trying to figure it out. So, in his On Truth and Why, in an Extra Moral Sense, Nietzsche writes, the drive toward the formation of metaphors 
is the fundamental human drive, which one cannot for a single instant dispense with in thought, for one would thereby dispense with man himself. So this is one of the explanations that I have, is this, you get rid of these metaphors and you destroy the human. Because metaphors, at least in this statement, which I really like, in a, in a way equals the human nature. Destruction, volatilization of metaphor in this text is itself a metaphor of destruction of a human. It is a writer's attempt, effort to accost the objective reality a little closer by manipulating the only tool available, language, by stripping it off its multiple layers of metaphors that keep us apart from the thing in itself. However, by removing one layer of metaphor, we only bump into another one, which appears to be the truth. Yet it is nothing more than a long-forgotten metaphor, a coin which has lost its pictures and now matters only as a metaphor. Also from the chain. So I'm still thinking. Yeah, this is the text that I prepared. You could have followed this with me. I try to translate this into English in a different way, using actually English uh, phrases that actually deal with this. And this is where the Naive.com was very helpful, because they had this uh, dictionary of idioms that you couldn't find anywhere. So I went ahead and I pulled out all the words, uh, all the idioms that are associated with body parts. Pulled them all out together, made a pool of, I don't know, hundreds of expressions, and started by pulling them to, putting them together into a mosaic of a text. And so the same thing could, could be done with another language, and I tried it with English, which I'm not ready to uh, post yet. So it's kind of stuck, I don't know. Okay, so this is where, this is the same text at a different angle, and it's being uh, covered with a text that is not readable right now, here is the detail, how it's covering, covering it up, in a way. And it's actually, now you can read, if you know Armenian, we're sorry and proud. This is the state propaganda covering up the actual reality of the battlefield, whatever happened over that, with very nice words, beautiful words. And, but again, as you see, on the other side, which is the Azerbaijani side in this case, the same thing happens. The same word is just in a mirror reflection because you know, they were saying the same thing anyway. I mean, a different wording will all love it, essentially the same thing. So, what they do is just they cover this whole thing together and they also mix into each other, but instead of fighting each other, they just turn into this blank page, which basically is uh, uh, the metaphor uh, for or the symbol for the uh, English word whitewashing. So now the black paper, the next uh, chapter is about black paper. Uh, during World War II, the telegrams announcing the death of a soldier were dubbed black paper, uh, though they were uh, white in color. This chapter is a reenactment of a scene from the Song of Old Days, a 1982, uh, an Armenian movie where a postman can't uh, deliver the news of the death of a woman's fourth and last son. He finds it impossible to deliver the black paper to his mother. Uh, yeah. The woman had, on the same day, sacrificed a ship, a surviving pagan tradition, in another otherwise Christian country, with a hope that her last son will return home alive from war. So, the postman had been trying to get himself to deliver the bad news for two months. The sacrifice of the ship becomes the last straw. Having drunk some wine to subdue his suffering, the postman succumbs to a nervous breakdown without moving his eyes away from the sacrificial ship's severed head, the postman eats the black paper. Would you like to eat this black paper? Yes, if you don't want it, I'll eat it. What are you doing, Nico? Nico. 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 Look at me, Nico. I'm looking at the eyes of the shame. I'm looking at the red ribbon of the, of the 
that is true. So don't touch me. So I tried to reenact this scene from the movie. It is a very emotional moment at that time, delivering the news of the death. By doing this, I basically used this black pages and wrote the, the words that this uh, Nicole Postman was saying on each page. And you just saw that. I, I can't give her the black paper. Can you keep the black paper? Look, 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 look. Look at the, look how, look at this um, eyes. Look at the eyes of this, uh, uh, the sheep, look how he looks. Uh, how about the ribbon? Look at the ribbon on his hat. The red ribbon. Like, do you think the sheep can do this? Like deliver, uh, 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 eat the black paper? And this is what happens here. This is the black paper being eaten. By who? Guess what? Mm -hmm. <laughs> It's not a sheep, but you know, it's a horse. I painted this. I eat the, I eat the paper for a minute. <laughs> uh, I use different pieces of this eaten paper to actually uh, put it in the book. And so you see this actual, I've eaten that. So <laughs> that's the, what happens is, I'll have to show it so you can understand how it works. It, this is at this point that you understand why throughout the book all these top pages were black. These were reports of the dead people. And finally, you know, there's, they're tearing off, tearing off. So anyway, so while he's talking here, it gets eaten. But when it's eaten, you know, it reveals a wall, which means, you know, we're still inside a wall because it's the mirror reflection of the wall, like how you would see from inside the wall. It's behind. As he's, he keeps talking and he eats, and it's actually synced with the movie, he, this starts being eaten just the moment when he actually starts eating it. So it's all matching. So anyway, eventually it comes into here while he's talking, and what happens, is something is being revealed in there as he keeps talking, certain letters. And until the very end, we don't know what they are, and here we can guess. It's the word soldier, dismembered soldier. And I use the Fibonacci you know, to arrange it, and I've used the Fibonacci a lot, like with the word peace, when it just revolves and ends. So, um, let me get there. And one thing that, when I was doing this experiment, I encountered here, I encountered a very interesting thing. So look, as I'm eating this paper and getting close to what he's talking about, look, I'm looking, I'm looking at him. I'm looking at the eyes of the ship. I'm looking at the red ribbon on his head. And, and I started like eating it more, and I realized when I removed it, the rest of the text, it's like, Red ribbon, looking at the red ribbon in Armenian, it actually red ribbon means can, can be also understood as red prison. The word ribbon. And I started thinking, did, did this director really try to use a message in a you know a cryptic message to show that he, and he keeps repeating, I'm looking at the red ribbon. In Armenian, it, yeah, it does sound like Garmir Bant Ingash, Garmir Bant, red prison, calling this USSR as such. You never know, 1982. Uh, it, it, everything else is eaten but the word Bant, which is prison. Anyway, here's a soldier, and here's the mother. So here, the, the eating of, you know, it is very interesting that both mother and the soldier share one letter, R, together, just like in English. Mother, soldier, and so mother here is sharing this R with, with him. And as you see, she's like sitting over the sun. And what happens next is the widow appears. So after the black paper is completely eaten, this numbered body of soldiers is revealed. His death was among the others supported by black papers. I already said that. 
and uh, so the mother has knelt before the dismembered sons, son with that only R as part of herself. It symbolizes the inseparable, inseparable link between mother and son. In this section, the so-called body language is stripped of its metaphorical value. Obviously, there are bodies made of languages. Language. So in the next scene, uh, the entry widow. With her mother-in-law motionless and stupefied by grief, the widow sets out to collect the pieces of his husband, of her husband, and arrange them in the right order. The prototype of the widow is Isis, the major Egyptian goddess who is considered the epitome of mourning widow. Her husband, Osiris, was murdered and dismembered by Set, his own brother, with the help of deities. Isis sets out to search for the pieces of her husband and succeeds in reassembling it. Consciously or unconsciously, or due to irrationality characteristic of desperate grievers, the widow tries to reenact Isis's deed to get her husband back. This is us. And this is Set, the dog like creature. And this is Osiris. And so she put them all back. And this is, by the way, an homage to Adam Saroyan, the minimalist poet, who wrote the letter M, the long M. But in this case, it's the Armenian A and Vo together. So this is what happens here is mother and widow become one because they also share a lot of letters. So here, Maid, Aid, Aid. I is the same for both of them. Might, I D. And so then mom collapses. Uh, hugging her reassembled but unrevived son, no longer able to contain her sorrow. When the widow remains alone, she is visibly less reserved in her body language. She, so the mother leaves. As she moves the arm, the letter Y. Uh, to her face, widow turns into the word come, and which also means courageous, Ari. But none of her spells has any effect on the soldier in this godless, all too real world. But she leaves without abandoning hope. She leaves by entreating with her body language. Come, courageous, come, courageous. She leaves. And so the soldier stays here, and soon, years later, months later, Days, weeks, months go by, and plants sprout out of his buried body. Plants that start from the letters of his body. Pomegranate tree, one of the most prominent symbols of Armenia. A rose, which is? A rose is a rose is a rose, as Gertrude Stein beautifully put it. The blooming and blossoming of these plants is demonstrated by means of textual tools, by switching from sun sedative type to sedative. Here. Sun said it turns into set. That's the blue. Months or years later comes back, comes back the widow, desperate, childless, lonely, she kneels down. Here. See? Is the widow coming? And she kneels down. And burns. Uh, so the thing is, because widow, the word widow in Armenian, in fact, is homophonous with the imperative mood of the verb burn, i.e., in colloquial Armenian. This desperate act of self immolation as it reaffirms the magical power of words. It may be interpreted as the widow's yet another desperate attempt to bring her loved one back by resorting to a myth. This time it's the Greek mythology, particularly Phoenix, though there is also Bennu in the Egyptian mythology. Thus, the goal is to rise from the ashes, but not just her own. Her first and foremost goal is to re reunite with her love. And so, while we wait for this uh, bird to rise from ashes, let me say a few words about the, uh, what, what I mean is called Tashanki bird script. That is, uh, letters with it written in, form, in the form of birds, which was quite trendy among Armenian medieval mini miniatures, illuminating manuscripts. Here is an example, Gospel of Matthew. Uh, birth of Jesus Christ's son. Here. Here. Uh, this is a rare example of an entire text written with, with birds, because bird script is usually used for the first letter of a chapter. Here, all of the letters are in bird. 
So now let's check back and see whether the phoenix rose from the ashes or not. Here's a wing, okay? Two, a bird, two of them. Five birds. Bird letters that spell, they, that spell soldier. And here is the widow taking, you know, flying from the ashes. They are together again, ecstatic. They got, to, they got to share the letter R. They are flying around in utmost happiness or despair. Oh no, they are trying to fly away, break on through the wall, but can't seem to find a passageway. But who are they really? Is it the reunion of the soldier and the widow? Let us go back to the story of Isis and Osiris. By bringing Osiris back to life, Isis enables Osiris to impregnate her posthumously. With Horus, he grows up to restore justice by dethroning Set, the usurper. And if you see, Horus has the form and shape of a bird. And these are probably their children, the, the, the horses that have come back to take revenge. And the cycle is going to continue of revenges. And they fall hopelessly. There's no exit from the wall. See? This is the same flock of birds at the beginning of the, of the book. Anyway, so. Here is the, the last part of a book, which is uh, if there is in a country someone who is capable of immuring himself in the wall of fortress, the country and its people are invincible. The Georgian uh, writer's words, this is the wall, this is the wall in Azerbaijani, and this is the Azeri text. I had, um, I asked uh, Alekper Aliyev, an Azerbaijani intellectual who lives in Switzerland, to help me with this book and translate this part into Azerbaijani and he did this for me and in the book it looks like this so this is the Armenian text and this is the uh, Azerbaijani test text and they're divided by this wall on their side is the divar, the Azerbaijani wolf, word for wall Armenian side is the Armenian word for pot, wall and then what happens is I modify the text, and this is in the deleted scenes of the book, by the way. And deleted scenes is like impossible things. So as an impossible thing, I modified the text by saying, if a country is capable of liberating the young man from the wall, that country and its people are invincible. And Alek Aliyev translated it for me into Azerbaijan. And now this is not just an Armenian dude or Azerbaijani dude. This is the human that is in the wall. And they put him there just to keep this wall active. And uh, I would like to use uh, so the same man from both sides. And then you see the Caesars? Men hate each other. Why don't you just read that? I will take care of this thing that I started earlier.
Liberation is not an easy task. <laughs> Liberated, um, and now we created a dialogue that these two languages can speak through this window and see each other okay. to this hue that was there. And now the problem is now that you can take the human out of a wall, and you it's hard to remove the wall from the person. But that's a totally different topic that we'll touch somewhat some other time. So thank you. Uh, thank you so much for uh, this very intoxicating <laughs> uh, reading of your um, untranslatable uh, book. Thank you for making it uh, understandable to us. And then we can kick off the discussion. Okay. Well, this is really a difficult commentary for me. <laughs> uh, not just because uh, I, I don't, I'm not uh, knowledgeable of the Armenian language, but because um, uh, of the complexity of, um, of, um, of the book like this. Uh, there is an aphorism by Karl Kraus that uh, states that uh, a poem is only good until you get to know his, its author. And then you know its author, and the poem is no longer good. So uh, we have we had a brilliant demonstration of the, the contrary because the book got better, <laughs> still even better after uh, not only getting to know the author, but listening to the author. Because uh, one thing that became completely apparent that you can only read this book, read uh, and uh, between the quotes, quotation marks, uh, in a performative way. The only way to read, uh, you have to, this is the kind of text that, as a matter of fact, the literature in the 20th century has provided us with several other examples of uh, uh, objects we call books, but which, which demand a completely new uh, way of reading and which demand, uh, um, uh, above all, a performative way, way of reading. Um, what interested, uh, well, the first time I heard, really heard about the book and uh, listened to a first presentation about the book, of course, this presentation by the author is a much richer uh, and, complex, and complex one. And I particularly liked um, uh, to hear that uh, um, the, the author is still figuring out right now what, um, because, and that, that's of course, is a, is a, a, a why he did this in the, this way or the other, which is also um, a living proof of the, the, the complexities inherent in this type of construction, in that it, uh, um, uh, it never is uh, quiet. Uh, this, it is a movable text, it is movable meaning, so it has to be performed, and the performance, in each case, may, be, may provide completely different, uh, completely different results. But let me just uh, um, uh, offer two or three topics of reflection. Uh, and I was saying, uh, as the first time I got acquainted, I heard of the book and I was presented to, uh, to this, to, to the book, uh, was really the idea of dismemberment that, uh, that then the organizers chose for the title of this, um, of this uh, um, uh, talk. Because being familiar with um, uh, classical ways of integrating violence and, and, and writing about violence, 
course, violence is not a new topic. It is a topic as old as literature itself. The first texts in European uh, tradition are texts about war. Um, the Homeric poems, of course. But uh, um, uh, when one reads classical theorists, uh, and I mean by classical theorists, uh, Sh Friedrich Schiller, for instance, who very much uh, in his theory, in his aesthetic writings, and his theory of the tragic, um, and really write a lot about violence, about what he calls the pathetic pathos, uh, uh, the use of pathos in, in literature. But uh, there is one central tenet that these writers and theoreticians always insist upon, that uh, violence must not be allowed to disrupt the text. That is to say, violence is always, of course, something irritating, something you cannot easily accommodate. But the, 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 the true demonstration of the power of the artist is to be able to integrate violence within a meaningful whole and not allow violence to be disruptive. Um, and as a matter of fact, a uh, main acquisition of, the, of literature and art in the 20th century was what someone calls the emancipation of the dissonance, to, to promote, to have disruption uh, as, as a, central, um, a central goal to pursue, to abandon the way of a, some kind of organic whole uh, that uh, that uh, uh, where violence could become meaningful, because uh, I think if I understood correctly uh, the, 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 what the book is about, uh, one of the things that precisely the book um, uh, tries to put forward is that violence can never be peacefully accommodated into a structure of meaning. Violence is always something that deeply disturbs, disrupts meaning, and the artist wants to find ways of dealing with that disruption. And I think that's precisely what is being what is being done done here. Um, of course, um, this was not just an aesthetic development; it has a lot to do with the very quality of violence. Um, and also in that way, I think the book has a lot to offer because. Um, one of the things that uh, uh, emerged um, uh, in, um, uh, in the representation of the First World War was really the total, um, uh, uh, total um, um, incommensurability between uh, the language public discourse, language that was used to talk about, about war, the figure of the hero, and so on. Uh, and when you are just uh, uh, torn to pieces by some kind of bomb, uh, you have no time to be a hero. Hmm? Uh, I'm reminded of a poem by a Portuguese poet, Anton Chudier, which was very important for me as a teenager. Uh, I was reminded uh, of that poem uh, at lunch, where uh, you, you remember uh, Portugal was involved in the colonial war, so the prospect of war was for my generation was a very concrete prospect. And, and, and the, the poet writes, it's not a very good poem, but anyway, it is, uh, they had been taught how a hero behaves and so on, but they, they had no time, simply had no time to be here. So technological war gives a new, it's, it's an, a totally new quality, quality um, uh, to destruction, it's mass destruction, but it's also, uh, technological destruction, it's industrially produced destruction. One way of looking at the First World War is as the deployment of an industry of destruction. The, the French uh, writer Henri Barbus uh, talks about the soldiers as ouvriers de la destruction, the workers of destruction, as if they were in the trenches uh, like the workers are in, in a factory plant. Um, and uh, so this, the, 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 uh, the, what becomes then a central topic is uh, uh, how the convention, using conventional la uh, language to approach the reality of war is, is a lie, is essentially a lie. Uh, and how you can, uh, you can um, get beyond that old lie of heroism and uh, um, uh, like in the very famous poem by Wilfred Owen, The Old Lie, that 
it is uh, uh, Dulce and Decorum as Pro Patria Mori. It is, it is good and it is uh, 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 a moral thing to do to die for one's own fatherland. So, um, um, uh, um, the way you treat language in this book, you, you really treat language uh, as a, a very physical reality. And that's, that's, that's the, um, uh, um, that allows you to um, take words literally and, and to provide the reader with a, with a, 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 with a, a, a kind of approach where uh, the physicality of words is uh, some, in some sense a, re a replication of the physical bodies that are also um, in question. Uh, like the window burning, or um, uh, because the, the, the first truth about war is that uh, what is being, what happens in war is that human bodies are being uh, torn apart, that uh, humans are suffering, and that uh, and all the nice words of conventional rhetoric uh, about war uh, are really uh, unmasked as some kind of lie. Uh, disguising that deeper reality that uh, an individual human body is being uh, is being torn apart. Very much in the same sense, later after the Holocaust, Theodore Adorno produced this famous phrase uh, that it would be barbaric to write poetry uh, after after Auschwitz. It is a very a much quoted, a much much misinterpreted phrase, uh, and I think uh, simply what Adorno was trying to say was that you cannot go on using conventional language. If you want to write about war, you cannot use the conventions of lyrical poetry. You have somehow to find your own language. You have to work on language. Um, uh, and you have to, uh, like uh, the poet Paul Celan did, to be able to uh, also, and it's very much what you do here too, because one, another, Central key, key word would be uh, silence. Uh, uh, to um, name name your words, uh, because um, uh, your use of language and, and uh, the way you play with language and the word play is here, I think, very adequate, very much. Um, uh, of course, not in a in a frivolous sense, not in a in a in a, in a, in a trivial sense, but uh, but in, in a deeper sense. Well, the Essentially, what you're doing is playing uh, with the materiality of the words on page. And that's why the typography of this book is overwhelming. It is incredible. Uh, I can imagine you must have supervised very closely the printing of this book. So, so I, that I it was in the printing house the whole time, like a worker. Yeah, I can see no other way of producing such a such an object. This is uh, amazing, really. What 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 has um, come out uh, of the process? But, but uh, um, um, anyway, this uh, uh, play with words is also, um, uh, I, I think it is all the time very conscious of the very, very close connection there is between language and silence. Uh, so, uh, 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 and this is also a, a very thoughtful way of approaching this topic of sheer violence and war. Um, to understand that war or extreme violence uh, tends to reduce language to the minimum and in the end tends to have language approach uh, a condition of silence. Um, and the way you, you play with this uh, notion of silence, uh, I think it's also a, um, um, So you, you, I think you, you, you are a, a <laughs> Adorno died a long time ago. But I think if Adorno were here, he would be, if I understand him correctly, he, he, would, he would find he knew someone who has understood the deep sense of his dictum very, very profoundly and took it very seriously and, uh, and uh, uh, set out to provide work on language in order to uh, really um, uh, uh, also find an ethical way that is to say, it is not just an, you were not just faced with an aesthetic problem. I think you were very much faced, and that surfaced in your in your presentation. You were very much faced with an ethical problem, um, uh, the, because uh, um, uh, um, 
really, if you approach the violence of war in a trivial conventional matter, you are mo somehow mocking the dead. That is to say, in the end, uh, you are almost killing them again. Uh, you, you are victimizing the victim again. Uh, um, and this is a problem that surfaces very much in the Holocaust literature, for instance. And, uh, uh, there is always this ethical problem of uh, looking for justice, of doing justice to, to the, the ones who were killed, those who didn't even have the right to have a nice photograph where, uh, who just, uh, whose remains are just blood, blood pictures themselves and some words, some conventional words, and, and that's a, a, a way of, uh, in some sense, killing them again. So, so uh, in the, the, the ethical task of uh, really doing justice, uh, I think it's, uh, um, I, I have no other way to say, it's moving, it's, it's really uh, uh, moving uh, to, uh, uh, to try to understand and to realize uh, how um, uh, how um, w the type of effort that that was put in to to do justice. So uh, I never thought in my life I would be sorry not to be able to understand Armenian, but this uh, mm -hmm. the, the time came. <laughs> it's too late for me now. But anyway, I'm I'm deeply grateful uh, for for your, for your book for your presentation. And okay, I, I think I stop here. Uh, we don't have too much time, uh, and I will not really read, even try to present something. Uh, you know, when uh, when you invited me to bring my car to the to this encounter, I had to decide, or simply to understand what it was that was expected from me, and then. Uh, in front of this, uh, in French they would say an OVNI mm -hmm. in English, an UFO, an undefined, unidentified flying object. Uh, and the question was first, were, uh, was I supposed to bring to the audience, to you, some reflections on this object? Or was I supposed to detach myself for we were supposed maybe to detach ourselves from the book and to maybe to develop some philosophical reflections on the possible or impossible connection between art and war. And as you said, actually, uh, they are incompatible. And that was my first uh, reaction. And this is why I first understood, uh, what I first understood of uh, what was expected from me, and it was the main reason why I accepted uh, the invitation to speak here. Uh, that was the second possibility. The third possibility was maybe to bring some geopolitical knowledge in order to give a context to this production. Uh, pa -pa 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 -pa. I try to, um, I apologize. I try to uh, read like this what I've written to bridge. Uh, this typographical film, because it is what it says about itself, is obviously Armenian. It has been published in 2016, a few months after a new outburst of violence and war at the borders of the country. And yes, its author is originated from that country where he has his roots and also his readers, I would say his constituency. But he has been living, uh, living in California for more than 10 years now, I don't know exactly how, how long. And he is part of a new Armenian diaspora, rapidly spreading new dispersion consecutive to the first dispersion of the Armenians a century ago, the one of Western Armenians, which took place a century ago, as I said, as a consequence of which the people who still call themselves Armenian are spread today all over the world. And this reality, this one, 
the one of the dispersion, is also part of the geopolitical knowledge that we would need to take into account in order to situate this typographical production within the context. The question being then, which context exactly? Should it be the context of the Caucasus, of a country which is locked up within a cl closed borders, borders that are worse than walls, a country which is submitted to a continuous and undeclared state of war, or should it be the context of the dispersion, that, which is also the context of the author, by the way, new context that began a century ago for the Western fragment of these people, the fragment that lived in the Ottoman Empire, a dispersion that is now an ongoing phenomenon also for the Eastern fragment, the one which is supposed to have a country and a state, the, the one that benefits from what they call sovereignty. Then, you see, we had three uh, possible approaches and so many questions. With the first approach, the interpretive one, in summary, the main question would have been to select meaningful elements in this visual object in order to confer it some sort of intelligibility related to the possible connection between war and art, because I repeat, there is no connection at all imaginable between war and art. With the second approach, the philosophical one independently of the visual object, independently of it, the challenge would have been to find a conceptual bridge between war and art. Uh, and with the third approach, the search for a geopolitical context, of course, the question would have been to find a way for defining a possible art, a possible art in a predicament of pure dispersion, in simple terms, what art in a diaspora? Answer the question, please, for yourself. It doesn't mean that individuals cannot practice art outside of defined political borders. It just means that we would need to define an artistic practice, an artistic production, in explicit relation with the absence of sovereignty or in explicit relation with, let's say, an endangered sovereignty. Then let's take a look at this, and probably this will be my, 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 what, what I will bring to this discussion here today, to you. In the common language, the word sovereignty has two meanings. The one external, the other one internal. In Armenian, there are two words for sovereignty. Inknishanutyun, kershan. Uh, which correspond to these two meanings, external and internal, respectively. The internal sovereignty is the sovereignty of the sovereign. Whoever the sovereign may be. The king or the people. The external sovereignty is the sovereignty of the state. Or, more generally, the sovereignty of any subject of law. And it's a very modern expression, subject of law. The idea of sovereign states began in the 17th century, treaties of uh, Westphalia and so on, but of course they didn't have the expression of subject of law to explain for, to themselves what the sovereign state is. Then, I repeat, I, do not, I cannot explain more, I apologize, but uh, the, then the sovereignty of uh, the, the external sovereignty is the sovereignty of the state, uh, the sovereignty of any subject of law, to the extent that he, a person, or it, a state, uh, is really subjected to a law that he or it contributed to establish. You are a subject of the, to, of the, so, the a subject of the sovereign, but you are the sovereign at the same time because you establish the law you are obeying to. In all European language, languages, there are one single word, one single word for these two meanings. It's very interesting. In all European languages, in Armenian, there are two. I will examine another time with you, if you invite me again, uh, whether there is only one word for two different notions, or whether in Armenian there are two words for one concept. If these two notions amount to the same, maybe. And at the very beginning of, this, of his unfinished book on sovereignty, which uh, I'm speaking of George Bataille, 
to this book, which was programmed, as you know, as the third volume of the series on the accursed share, Georges Bataille writes the following. He says, at the very beginning, the sovereignty of which I'm speaking has little to do with the sovereignty of the states, defined by international law. Wow, then Georges Bataille, why is it the same word if it has nothing to do? He doesn't ask himself the question. That's very interesting. He knew how to dissociate one meaning of the word from the other one, but he did not want to know anything about the double meaning of the word. And if for him sovereignty was defined by a pure expenditure without accumulation, because what, what sovereignty was for, for him, then his problem was uh, how to make this pure expenditure dépense in French. Um, uh, possible in the objective world without war. This is said explicitly at the end of the book, the written part of it. He says, la, la guerre est en passe d'être bientôt, la banqueroute uh, frauduleuse du genre humain, war is on the way of becoming soon the fraudulent bankruptcy of the human species. And uh, almost on the last page, le problème dont je parle, l'épuisement sans guerre de l'excédent. The problem I'm speaking about, the exhaustion of the excess without war, uh, which was precisely with that which is impossible in the objective world uh, that we know. There is no, uh, nothing like that possible, of course not. The one in which there is uh, the world that we know, the objective one, the one in which there is uh, our world the one in which there is no sovereignty without power, without violence, without war, without the supposition of war. There is no sovereignty without war. And of course, in the definition itself, I mean. And of course, then Bataille had no other recourse but to define a subjective process of sovereignty, which is the one of art, uh, of what he called precisely sovereign art, l'art souverain. And to call for a strict, strict separation between sovereignty in the objective world and the sovereignty of art, in order to define, he says, I, I quote, the place and the meaning of the man of sovereign art in this world. In order to define himself, he had then to again dissociate the objective world in which uh, sovereignty is related with war in all cases without exception. And himself, as the man of sovereign art, the only one, by the way, there is no other one that, than himself, and Nietzsche, of course. Uh, then the one for whom uh, maybe it is imaginable to have sovereignty without war, and that's art. Wow, we have the conceptual uh, uh, framework for thinking here uh, about the uh, a possible relation. An, an impossible relation, but a, a relation nonetheless between war and art. And uh, the man of sovereign art, uh, he says, is the only one who can measure up with the disproportionate catastrophe in the threat of which we are living. Il est à la mesure de cette catastrophe démesurée dans la menace de laquelle nous vivons. Who? The man of, the, the man of sovereign art himself, and Nietzsche. Bataille is thus the only author that I know who tried to conceptualize the possibility of a sovereign of sovereignty without power. There is no sovereignty without power. He is the only one who tried to conceptualize the possibility of sovereignty without power, which means without war, without the presupposition of war. But he is also the only one who, through his insistence on sovereignty, his obsession with sovereignty, was able to establish then a conceptual bridge, as I explained, between war and art. Which also gives us some empirical answer to the third question, what art in the predicament of absolute dispersion? Uh, what art in the, in the dispersion? And uh, a sovereignty without... Uh, Without power, uh, is that uh, possible? Her answer, of course it is impossible, sovereignty without power. 
precisely. Art tells the impossible. It is not made to tell us what is possible. The diaspora is a bearer, I mean the dispersion, because the diaspora is the place where there is no sovereignty. It's the diaspora is the bearer of that impossible, the incarnation, the future of that impossible. Now you see, uh, I wrote two pages here about the book, about uh, and uh, the, about the wall, about the war and wall. Wall is bad. War is bad erasm. I I'll risk it because uh, we heard the author speak about that. I, I will just uh, translate again for myself as he translated at the end, at the very end, these two sentences which are the, the backbone of what he wants to say. Yet in mere room, then I translate, uh, if in a given country there is someone who is able to break him, himself or herself up in the wall of a fortress, he says, and mirror. Then that country and that people are invincible, cannot be defeated. And then the last one, translation, if a country is able to release the one who is bricked up in the wall of the fortress, to release, to liberate, to free, then that country uh, are invincible and so on, and that people are invincible. Yes, of course. On the last page we have again the same sentence in Lazarus Turkish. Uh, there is clearly, clearly a message here addressed by the author to his fellow Armenians and to all Azeris, probably all those who are able to hear the message, to liberate the boy, the one who is necessarily, inevitably enclosed in the wall of sovereignty, of all sovereignties, to liberate him from the internal violence and the internal power supposed and always carried out by the idea and the reality of sovereignty. Is that possible? Of course it is impossible. It is tantamount to imagine, again, a sovereignty without violence, without internecine violence or without internal power. And we arrive then at the same conclusion uh, than as the, the end of the first part. Uh, is it impossible? I asked and I, I, I answered, of course it is impossible. Art tells the impossible. It is not made to tell us what is possible. And now let me read one more page. Almost 100 years ago, in 1921, uh, another Armenian writer, Leon Chant, who was a Western Armenian, who had studied in uh, Azin, and he became an Eastern Armenian. We are very interested. It is the only one, there is no other, it is the exception. There is no communication between Western and Eastern in the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century. Who was a successful playwright and at the same time a political activist. Wrote a drama called The Unchained in Armenian Shukai uh, A play, uh, a drama that I'm sure he doesn't know. Uh, because uh, what is Western Armenia, what is the diaspora, is totally unknown in, in Armenia. And this totally unknownness, if I may so, of what uh, uh, concerns the diaspora in Armenia is a phenomenon by itself. Then uh, the wrote a drama called The Unchained, uh, which he read before a chosen audience, a political audience, in the immediate aftermath of the downfall of the First Republic, we are in 1921, the spring of 1921, in extremely tragic and even disastrous circumstances, just after the Republic had been taken up in the lap of the Soviet Union after a short period of civil war. Shant was on the way of exile, an exile that would prove to be without hope and without return. But if exile is a human and collective predicament away from sovereignty, is it? Yes, it is. He had already been in exile before the birth of the Republic, 
because the Republic lasted just two years. There were two years of sovereignty, if you want. In any case, the same was also true for his first auditors. They had fought for the sovereignty of their country, and they had been defeated in their efforts. The chain of the title of the drama is Agabast, the one who, in the Armenian legend, is forever bricked up or unmuted, locked up in the cave. And it's the same as the Georgian legend, which has the boy um, 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 bricked up in the, in the wall. In the play, a prophet named Narash calls for a revolution. He calls for a liberation of Ardavast from his chains. A call that everyone in the play, in the play, understands as a call for a political revolution. But to work for a political revolution means to work for the return of power. You destroy one, you establish another one. One way or another. Through this, and that's why it is called the revolution, by the way. It's an eternal return of power. Through his emphasis on this eternal return of power, Shant actually offers a fierce criticism of sovereign power in general. And he raises a messianic claim, and the word, I insist on the word, a messianic claim for the end of that power. And like all messianisms, of course, it's a, it's a critique. It's a critical discourse. A uh, messianic claim uh, for the end of that power, for any power, exactly like Walter Benjamin was doing in the same year, exactly the same way, uh, when he wrote in uh, his uh, 1922 essay, So Critique der Gewalt, uh, usually translated uh, as Critique of Violence in English, huh? but which should be translated with no less accuracy as Critique of Sovereign Power. Gewalt is power, in German it's not violence. Or it is, but it's also, also power, of course. The art, that article also could be read, the one of Walter Benjamin, and under, understood in different ways, just like Shant's drama. It stated something about history, about the coupled sovereignty power, from the point of view of the end of history, the messianisms of that, uh, which Benjamin called divine violence, had at least one purpose, to predict the possibility of a revolution on this earth, a historical one, but it had also the purpose of criticizing every revolution to the extent that every revolution re-establishes the same type of sovereign power. There is no other. Now, coming back to the author of the Unchained, Le Ranchant, the problem is that the same Le Ranchant, this time as a political activist and as a party member, which is, is, he also was, wrote in the same years, 1922-23, a series of essays and articles where he explained that the people or a nation worthy of that name is defined by the will to power uh -huh, that inhabits at, at, at its core. A will to power which could be understood more precisely as a will to sovereignty. A will to sovereign power. And he was saying exactly the contrary of what he said in the play in the political, uh, political uh, articles. That's a usual contradiction of every, uh, <coughs> every what? Everyone. Of course, at the same time, that will to sovereign power and that conception of a political party of being the incarnation of that will to power were the justific justification of the protracted existence of that very same political party in the diaspora. In a situation, it's the Tashnas. Tashnas. In a situation where we could have thought that there was no nothing to do uh, for a political party, the diaspora, the dispersion, there is no poli policy, policy anymore. And then it's the last paragraph. Fortunately, or hopefully, there is no political activist in Karen Barsian, although I am not sure. But maybe Karen himself will give us today, but now it's too late, a uh, tra political translation of his call. He's called to release the boy who is bricked up in the wall. Uh, was it a call for a political revolution? Or was it a messianic claim for the end of any sovereign power? 
which is, as I say, in the case of Le Grand and Walter Benjamin, would be tantamount to a general critique of sovereign power. And that's my question. Thank you very much. <laughs>